What picture comes to your mind? Just think for a minute. Moses parting the Red Sea. What picture comes to your mind? Is it, uh, is it from a movie? An animated movie or live action? Is it possibly Charlton Heston parting the Red Sea? So here's the question. If I ask you to visualize the heaping up of the Jordan River so that at its flood stage, it was dry 16, 18 miles to the north of where Israel was camped, uh, all the way down to the Dead Sea, like five miles the other direction. If I ask you to picture, the, uh, to visualize the heaping up of the Jordan River for these 20, 23 miles of distance, what picture comes to your mind? Have you ever seen it in a movie? Now, I have a terrible memory in a lot of ways, and, but I do not remember ever seeing a, a movie, a, a, an image of the uh, Jordan River water being heaped up for miles. Um, maybe, maybe you do. But here's the thing. Obviously, most people have heard of the parting of the Red Sea, and many people have an, an image that comes to their mind uh, from something they've seen in that regard. Uh, but equally powerful is the miracle of the, uh, the heaping up of the Jordan River, as we'll see in our study this time of Joshua chapter 4, if you'll turn with me there. And uh, all the references there in the fourth chapter of Joshua to the Exodus, to Moses, to the Red Sea, not only was it an equally powerful miracle, it was intended by God to be the bookend that they would go together, um, that he brought his people out uh, of bondage, uh, parting the waters, and he brought his people into the promised land, parting the waters, bookends that God intended to teach, uh, and for you to teach your children, and uh, bookends that God intended would teach the world about who he is and what he has done in space and time. There was a time in my life when I thought it would be a neat thing to collect bookends. As a pastor, you have lots of books, and uh, so you have a library, and uh, it's nice, I thought, to have collected some special bookends along the way, and, uh, and I, I kept my eye out for them, and early in our marriage, when we were traveling in Europe, we bought some, uh, some bookends, uh, brass, uh, um, geese, and... And, uh, but I quickly gave up on that idea for a number of reasons. Even though, if you look, if you look in any antique stores or whatever, there are always uh, really kind of awesome bookends. There are gaudy, ugly bookends, but there are some neat bookends as well. Uh, statues of famous figures and, and all kinds of things made out of uh, stone, uh, wood, uh, metal, uh, all kinds of things. But I quickly deserted the idea because uh, they take up too much room on your bookshelf. As a pastor, the bookshelves just get full, and then you start stacking them on each other, and bookends take up room because they come in a pair. I might have one pair in my office here at church, and I might be using one of them uh, in one row, and I have the other one. I think the other one is not even on the end. It's just in front uh, because I don't know where else to put it, and somebody gave me the bookends. But um, you, uh, there's just no room for them because they come in a pair. And that's exactly what the parting of the Red Sea and the heaping up of the Jordan River are. They are forever a pair. They go together. And uh, we said last time um, that uh, Joshua chapters 3 and 4 go together. And uh, we looked at the third chapter. So this time we look at Joshua chapter 4, to which you've already turned and uh, before we dive in, let's pray together. Lord, we're asking uh, tonight uh, with gratitude for the chance to study the Bible together and the beautiful gift that is the rich Old Testament historical narrative by which you reveal yourself in space and time, in history, in places we could go visit today, reliably, historically, verifiably, a revelation, uh, we, we are grateful and we're praying tonight that by your Spirit, you would help us 
uh, to understand the sermon that's preached in the chapter before us. We do know, we are learning how to study historical narrative. We, we do know that uh, it preaches timeless truth to us about you. So we ask that as we turn now to Joshua and specifically the other half of this Joshua 3 and 4 uh, narrative that you would help us uh, to understand that your spirit would apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. So the third and fourth chapters go together. Of course, you know, none of the books of the Bible came with titles, chapters, or verse divisions. We've done all that to help ourselves, just as we've organized the Bible into the way it's structured to help ourselves. Sometimes I'm not so sure that all of that works, but nevertheless, uh, chapters three and four are one story. It all goes together. Actually, it bleeds into chapter five, as we will ultimately see as well. But uh, in earnest, uh, chapters three and four are a narrative that go together. And if you look at the last verse of chapter three, it says, Now the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Now, if you look uh, into the fourth chapter, uh, halfway through the 10th verse, and most translations uh, set that off as another paragraph, halfway through the 10th verse, uh, it picks up with saying, the people passed over in haste, and when all the people had finished passing over, etc. The point being that the narrative really could uh, stop there with verse 17 and pick up there in the middle of verse 10, all that to say that the writer structurally interrupts himself, structurally interrupts the way he tells the story for emphasis and inserts chapter 4 verses 1 through the first half of verse 10. He puts that in the middle of the narrative that it might be emphasized. Then for further emphasis, structurally, uh, he includes an exhortation by Joshua in light of that insert that is really preaching the substance of what is inserted there at the beginning of the fourth chapter. He, has, uh, he ends the whole narrative in chapter 4 with the Joshua preaching a sermon, as it were, on that inserted portion. I mean, we've said all along that one of the ways to understand historical narrative is that it preaches to us timeless truth, uh, and we should ask when we're studying it, what is this writer preaching about when he tells me this story? Uh, well, this uh, narrative includes a sermon, so we don't even have to wonder. It includes Joshua's comments that help explain the, the purpose uh, for what is recorded there in the insert. So all that to say that structurally, the way the writer, inspired by God, puts together this fourth chapter and uh, the two chapters together is that instead of just continuing on with the thought he had in the last verse of chapter 3, he inserts a significant little part of everything that goes on there, and then he comes around at the end and preaches a, has Joshua preach a sermon on it. Uh, and so what uh, that is about is, uh, is very significant, and he helps us see the emphasis. So, we're going to do something unorthodox, and that is we're going to pick up with what we were just reading, uh, the end of chapter 3, and start with the middle of verse 10. So the end of chapter 3, Now the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Middle of verse 10, The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. 
And the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before, because as chapter 3 taught us, it was flood stage uh, when all this took place. So, here you see uh, in the closing uh, narrative regarding this incident uh, that the ark is front and center again. The ark is front and center, as it was in the third chapter. Uh, of all the references uh, to the ark in the Old Testament, in these two chapters, there are it's almost 10% of the references. You have 10 references to the ark in chapter 3, and, uh, and you have another 7 references here in chapter 4. It's central to this whole story, this narrative. The ark, as we said last time, uh, the little box, gold inside and out, gold lid, built at the directions of God, not very big at all, rectangular, has the Ten Commandments in it, the seat was where the high priest would uh, sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial lamb once a year on the Day of Atonement. Uh, so the ark was the symbol of the presence of God. That's what it was about. Made possible. It was God. Uh, it was the footstool of God in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle that was the tent. God's tent pitched in the middle of your tents. It was the symbol of the presence of God. Made possible by that shed blood, by the atonement. When the priests carrying this ark that pictured, that reminded, that represented the presence of God among his people. When the priests carrying the ark, the narrative says, stepped out of the Jordan River. You remember the minute their soul touched the Jordan River, the water heaped up. And they stood in the middle of it during the passing of everyone. But now that everyone has passed, the narrative says... When the priests carrying the ark, and they could only carry it by poles through the loops on the side, if they touched it, that was it. Um, when the priests carrying the ark stepped out of the Jordan River bed, the water returned immediately to its uh, torrent uh, of flood stage uh, activity. Uh, immediately. And the point being what? They step with the ark, the water heaps up. They stand out with the ark, the water goes back. The point is that God, this symbolized the presence of God, that God was the one who heaped up the waters and let them go back. There was nothing else that caused this to be. This was a work of the Lord. Verse 12, those of you who've been studying with us from the beginning, you know, hearkens back to chapter 1 and hearkens back to the life and ministry of Moses. And when they arrived on the east side of the Jordan... Uh, this was where two and a half of the 12 tribes wanted to stay. It's a beautiful area. And, uh, and Moses said, okay, yes, that can be your possession, uh, but you've got to come with us to conquer the promised land. So here are, are the 12 tribes, the, the two and a half tribes in verse 12, uh, keeping their promise. And again, the picture then is, is that this is a, all the people kind of experience. They're to do this all together. Um, verse 13 underscores that uh, this would be a battle, that it would be a fight, though the battle was the Lord's and he was the, to lead them as he had displayed his power. Uh, even in uh, bringing them through the, the river, they were going to have to fight. And then verse 14 fulfills what you'll recall God said back in chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. That's exactly what happens. God keeps his promise. But here you see the continuity between Moses and Joshua, between what God was doing through Moses and what he's doing with Joshua. Moses leads them out. Joshua leads them in. There's continuity, even as there's progress but all those observations made in the verses we just read, all that said, chapter 4, even by, as we've noted, the way it's structured and written, has another emphasis. It has another emphasis uh, of its own. 
In addition to all that we've been learning uh, in uh, these details, there's another emphasis here. And uh, so we go back to the first verse of the fourth chapter, and we read, When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, and you pause and you notice, that whatever this unique contribution that's about to come to us in the fourth chapter might be, uh, it is the Lord's initiative. This is his idea. In addition to what he's taught them uh, by having the uh, ark carried to the edge, uh, held in the middle and then carried out, uh, and its connection to the, the miracle, a uh, display then of the presence and the power of God, in addition to all that, God has another idea, and this is his initiative. This is his idea, so it reflects he knows what his people need, uh, and you just bear that in mind. He said to Joshua, verse 2, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man. And you recall that in the third chapter, the twelfth verse, uh, this uh, instruction had been given, now therefore take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. But we were held in suspense, and uh, in real time and in the recording of it, this uh, moment in time had a lot of suspense. Slow unfolding, God managing this, wanting them to observe along the way. You remember he had them stand at a distance. Every little piece uh, unfolds as, as God uh, so deliberately walks this through. So here we're picking up what was said back in chapter 3, verse uh, 12. Uh, and that's the way it works in your life many times. God sort of unfolds it with some suspense. You don't quite know. You wonder. You go through the day. You wonder how things might be. Uh, and uh, you know God has it all in view, but he's sort of walking you through by faith a little at a time. Verse 3, And command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. So here's the new ingredient. God's initiative, 12 stones. That's the, the new part at God's initiative, 12 stones. Why 12? One for each tribe. So again, true for all. Uh, this is a people of God truth. It applies to everyone. Uh, the 12 stones are to be taken from the place where the priest stood in the middle of the Jordan, the waters heaped up at a long distance, where the priest stood in the middle of the Jordan, doing what? What were they standing in the middle of the Jordan doing? They were holding the ark. The 12 stones are taken from, taken from the place where the ark was held by the priest in the middle of the river on dry ground. So God wants them never to forget that. He has them take these 12 stones this is for all God's people uh, to grasp. Um, the reason the riverbed was dry uh, was the presence and power of God, and he wants them to remember that. Verse 4, Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. First little aside is, upon his shoulder. Uh, these weren't little rocks. These weren't little, even you know, sizable little round rocks. Our, our family... Uh, picks things out of water where it's a beach or river and we bring them home. My, my yard has shells. It has stones from creeks in North Carolina. Uh, we pick up pine cones and bring them home from Europe or, or California. We're just nuts. But anyway, these are not things you could pick up with your hands and stick in your suitcase and bring home. These are significant rocks such that you have to carry them on your shoulder. I think... Uh, 
about the only thing I carry on my shoulder these days are bags of mulch. If I'm going to mulch my yard and I have to go buy 20 bags of mulch, uh, you can carry them to the backyard one at a time holding them like this. Or the easiest way is to flip them up on your shoulder. Somehow carrying a, a heavy weight like that, it's much easier just to rest it on your shoulder than to carry it with your two hands. These are significant stones. But the key word here, or, or one of them, here at the beginning of verse 6, is this a Hebrew word, sign. These are signs. That's such a significant biblical word, Old and New Testament. This idea of a sign, something that symbolizes, something that signifies, as in the word sign, spiritual truth. All the miracles of Jesus are referred to as signs in the New Testament. In other words, they weren't ends in and of themselves. They taught a spiritual truth. The miracles that the apostles were able to do were called signs. Uh, the uh, same description as the miracles of Jesus uh, because they taught a spiritual truth. Uh, and uh, that's the word here. It's a very, very significant uh, biblical word. The ark itself was not an end in and of itself. It was a sign. Um, the priests carrying the ark, not ends in and of themselves. They were signs and symbols, representations of the Lord Jesus. Passover was a sign. We uh, call the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism signs and seals. Uh, they signify spiritual truth. They're not an end in and of themselves, either one. They symbolize spiritual truth. So the 12 stones uh, were to be a sign that recalled, that spoke spiritual truth to God's people. That's what they were intended to be. We pick up in the middle of verse 6. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. So the stones were a symbol of the presence and the power of God. You say, well, that's the same thing as the ark. Essentially, yes. The stones were to remind them of what uh, God uh, did with uh, the ark, the role that the ark had played in the passing. The only way they got over, the only way the water had heaped up was the ark. And the stones were to be signs of the presence and power of God enabling that to, to happen. Uh, it was... Uh, a reminder of how they crossed the Jordan River. It was to be a reminder, uh, a memorial, not just uh, to those who walked across uh, and then went on to fight the Canaanites. You remember back in chapter 3, uh, verse 9 and 10, it says, um, And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will drive, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. This experience, this heaping up of the Jordan, the ark being the, the uh, initiator of that, is going to be a sign that you will be able to uh, be victorious in the battles uh, coming forward. So, the stones were to remind them of the uh, heaping up of the water because of the ark, the presence of God, so that they could, every time they look at those stones, and this was base camp, so they would venture out and come back. Every time they looked at the stones, they would remember the presence and the power of God, and they would know, uh, verse 10, chapter 3, that the living God is among them, and that he will without fail drive out their enemies. But... It wasn't just uh, for them. We're taught here uh, in verse 6 that it was uh, for their uh, children. And the language here, where it anticipates a child asking a question and you teaching the child, is the very same language in Exodus chapter 12 when God instituted the Passover. 
And so the children would ask, you know, why, why are we doing this? What does this mean as they observed the Passover? And they would explain that this is how God brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage, uh, the, the blood on the doorpost, uh, and the angel of death passing over. It's the very same language here. When your children ask in time, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them. So it was for them. It was to teach them. It was something that they were to teach. The spiritual truth signified by the 12 stones uh, was something that they would benefit from as they look forward to the battles in front of them, reminded of the presence and the power of God, but something then that they would pass on to their children, but not just their children. It was to be a memorial forever. So it's a truth written down in Scripture for all God's people forever. The same thing is true. You should learn from the crossing the Jordan River, uh, symbolized by 12 stones taken from the middle, uh, because of the presence of the ark there, that God is present with you in your endeavors in this life, and His power is there to enable you to be more than a conqueror. It's timeless. Now, in the midst of this is, a very, is another very, very important uh, uh, biblical word that goes right along with these. And that is the word, a memorial. There at the uh, end of verse 7, forever. It's from the Hebrew verb, to remember. And throughout Scripture, God is, is telling us to remember and giving us helps uh, that we might remember. Uh, it's a pervasive thing. You remember the what's written on the front of the communion table. And why is it written there? It says, do this in remembrance of me because Jesus taught us that. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you do it. Uh, so you recall this memorial, 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, was God's idea he knows our frame. We are forgetful. My wife was trying to convince me of something uh, in the car on the way here tonight. And I said, no, I don't know. She said, you forgot. I, that never happened. You just don't remember. I, she says, we've done this for two or three years now. I still don't remember. We're forgetful. Uh, and God knows it. But here's the deal. If they forget going into the promised land now, first steps in, if they forget the power and the presence of God, how would they, chapter 3, verse 10, know that the living God will without fail drive out from before them their enemies? How would they know if they forget? Commentator Dale Ralph Davis says, the greatest enemy of faith may be forgetfulness. The greatest enemy of faith may be forgetfulness. You know you're secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know you have eternal life, but your life day to day can be filled with anxiety and doubt and worry and fear and all because you forget that God who loved you enough to send his son, Romans chapter 8 verse 32, this is that theologic we were talking about last time, he who spared not his own son, how will he not also with him freely give you all things? You must have forgotten that God gave his son for you. That's the idea. The greatest enemy of faith may be forgetfulness. You remember uh, the words of Moses near the end of his life, the second giving of the law, the book of Deuteronomy, how he so powerfully anticipates what would actually be the circumstance of the first people to read the book of Joshua. Those people recorded, uh, whose lives are recorded in the book of Judges, Deuteronomy chapter 8. You remember these words of Moses given by God through Moses. Verse 11, Deuteronomy 8. <clears throat> Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be uh, be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I'm reading this and I'm hearing Abraham Lincoln's uh, Thanksgiving proclamation in 1863. And he talks about how in the middle of this conflict, God has been so good and supplying for us so abundantly. 
uh, and, and yet we forget. Uh, and and here's, here's the same thing. Who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God for it, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, then I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish, etc., etc. So this is the, the note uh, that God sounds repeatedly in Scripture for his people, uh, and there you see it. And this is exactly the temptation, the life circumstance, as we said of the first readers of the book of Joshua, those about whom we read in the book of Judges. James Montgomery Boyce writes, quote, the people needed a memorial because like ourselves, they tended to forget the goodness and mighty acts of God on their behalf, or as we're saying, the presence and the power of God. They tended to forget. Francis Schaeffer, in his uh, exposition of Joshua applies the text this way. He says, God today gives us things we can remember. This way, when the waves get high, we can look back and see how God has worked. And that helps to give us a faith in the future. Even in this year, I know that if you pondered, you would remember all the ways God has given to you, even as he has challenged your faith to believe in his presence and his power, it has been a year that has tried your faith uh, regarding the presence and power of God. But I know if you consider it, he has, even in this year, in many ways, shown you that he is there and that he is powerful. Uh, ours is to remember. God today, Schaefer says, gives us things that we can remember we can look back and see God has worked, and that helps to give us a faith in the future. Um, verse 8, And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. Pause before reading further. That verse causes many commentators to believe that there were two piles of 12 stones, that there were 12 in the middle where the priests had been, uh, and then there were 12 carried out and erected uh, beside it. And... Uh, but uh, I think at that point, it's just a translation problem. Um, although there are many whom I respect who think there are two piles of stones, and it does no harm to believe that there were two piles of stones. Uh, but I really think uh, there's nothing else in the whole chapter that addresses a second pile in, in the middle of the, of the river. All the rest of the content is about the stones taken out. And uh, so you could translate it this way. The NIV, actually, the NIV translates it this way. And Joshua set up 12 stones. This is verse 9. And Joshua set up 12 stones that had been in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. For the priest bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, uh, the people passed over in haste. Um, the thought, however you view the, the number of uh, piles of stones, uh, again, I come down on the side of one. But uh, it, it isn't uh, in and of itself significant. What, what is significant is this, is that for God's people, Christians, believers, B.C., A.D., all God's people, their faith is, your faith is not in some philosophical concept. It's not in a, a set of ideas. 
uh, is not in a set of rules. Uh, for believers, uh, biblical faith is in things God being present and powerful, things that God has done in a certain place on the face of this earth at a certain time. A certain place, a certain time. The entire Christian faith is rooted in history, uh, in space and time, and if it's not, there's no faith. Uh, substantively, the most significant thing in that regard is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No resurrection, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, there's no faith. The entire uh, revelation of God uh, in the scriptures is not just philosophical ideas or religious ideas, as has so often been the case uh, in uh, the religions of men, but it is uniquely rooted in what God has done, being present and powerful in a certain place at a certain time. And all the Old Testament, all that happens and is recorded, B.C., uh, is uh, pointing forward uh, to the fulfillment of these things when God comes into this world, the incarnation of the Son, He lives, He grows up, He dies, He's raised from the grave, and He ascends into heaven. Here's the thing about the Christian faith. You can go to the Jordan River. As opposed to any location in the Book of Mormon, you can go to the Jordan River. As opposed to the, uh, the uh, Koran, that is a... a idea after an idea after a law after a law with some uh, reference uh, to uh, uh, that which is recorded in the Bible, the, the history in the scriptures uh, is, is all about uh, place and time that you can go with an archaeologist. So you and I could get on a plane if uh, the uh, travel bans work to our advantage, and we could go and stand on the east side of the Jordan River. And we could go and ponder walking through it and stand on the west side. We can go to all these places that we are going to study in the book of Joshua. Uh, just as you could uh, get on a plane and fly to Jerusalem and walk outside the city to what is Calvary. And uh, you could consider where the empty tomb would be. You can go to the Jordan River. You can go to Jerusalem. Our faith is rooted in what God has done. Ours is to remember. Ours is to remember what God has done. A memorial to what God has done. It's not a memorial to a, an idea, not a memorial to a, a, a thought process, a religion. It's a memorial to what God has done at these places here at the Jordan and what it meant. Schaefer says the same thing is true of your life. Uh, God gives you things that he has done in your life if yours is you are his. He gives you things to remember. They're not on this magnitude, but they're the same sorts of ways that he... And Schaefer likes to say uh, that among those, the, the most easily recognizable things would be, if you're a believer, you have a story of how that came to be, how you became a believer. And that's the working of the hand of God. Whether you were raised in a Christian home or you had a dramatic conversion, how and when you became a Christian was the act of God. God in space and time working in circumstances to bring you to yourself. And you as a believer can remember how God brought that out. It's a memorial to what he's done and, uh, and be strengthened in your faith. That is the Christian faith. I went to a doctor uh, last week for uh, a checkup. And uh, the doctor refers to me as reverend and the nurse overhears. And so when the nurse comes in uh, to take uh, my vitals, she says, so you're a pastor? And I said, yes. And she said, I'm a Christian too. I said, awesome. When did you become a Christian? She said when she was 11 years old. She grew up in Jamaica uh, at her grandmother's knee. And she said, when did you become a Christian? Uh, and she said, how did you become a Christian? And I said, I became a Christian at 15. I followed the, the girl to church who then became my wife. And she says, oh, how awesome. What a wonderful story. But the point is, we both have a story. And you have a story. And it's uh, God in space and time bringing you to himself. 
And uh, that's what you are to remember uh, as, a, as a believer, uh, why this idea is so important that you not be forgetful. God has given you things to remember that you might know how he is in the midst of your challenges. Uh, chapter 4, verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10. For the priest bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. So here again you see the, the, uh, the line of work continuing Moses to Joshua. You see God keeping his promises uh, and, uh, and stretching that through and you knowing that. And you recall, and we'll keep, try, keep trying to bring it to your memory, that what hangs over the entire book of Joshua is the land. It is going into the land that God had promised, going back to Abraham. But really, going back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, one day, looking forward, uh, as uh, Abraham did and all the patriarchs, not to a, a building that's made by human hands, uh, but the city of God. Uh, and, and so the promised land has always been a picture, a symbol of uh, a sign of, uh, of eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. That's the subject that, that uh, hangs over the whole book. The whole book is about God keeping his promises uh, in, the, uh, in bringing his people into the promised land. Uh, and all of that, uh, uh, all that that symbolized. So again, you're taught here in the midst of this chapter, God keeps his promise. You have been brought into the promised land. You have eternal life. Think often on what God has done to prove that that's true. Failing to think upon what God has done to prove that that's true will dramatically affect negatively your life. The way you think, the way you react, the things that you do. So, Let's turn now, in closing, to what God inspires Joshua to say about this that he inserts into the middle of the narrative uh, tonight. Let's, uh, let's see what God inspires Joshua to say. We pick up at verse 19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month. They encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. What a great sermon, huh? And I like the second person, the way he preaches there. But before we get to the substance, this observation, we saw in the third chapter when we studied all the allusions to the parting of the Red Sea, one of them was this reference that gets repeated here to dry ground. Uh, and, and we discussed that to, to some extent. The references to, the, to crossing the Red Sea are heaped up here in these closing lines of the fourth chapter. Uh, the waters of the Jordan... Um, the end of verse 18, uh, returned uh, to their place. That is the very same verb used in Exodus chapter 14, verses 27 and 28 of the Red Sea, returning uh, uh, when uh, the waters uh, were finished being parted, returning, very same verb. But even more pointedly, verse 19, on the 10th day of the first month, Exodus chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, uh, is when God institutes the Passover, the last plague that uh, on the firstborn that allows his people to leave. This is really the means by which his people leave bondage. The 10th day of the first month is the first day, Exodus chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, of Passover. 
and every Passover held since. So the thought is 40 years ago from this moment in time, this very day, uh, God uh, brought his people out and now he's bringing his people in. So this day on the calendar is coordinated, the bookends of the Red Sea and the Jordan River, bringing his people out, bringing his people in. And with the reference there in verse 23 to the Red Sea itself, for your God, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. With that reference to the Red Sea itself, you see the bookends uh, that are these two miracles. They go together. But all that observed, here is the uh, sermon on this moment uh, that is before us uh, with the 12 stones, the signs, the memorial. Here is the sermon on the whole idea. And I think you can picture Joshua standing next to this huge mound of uh, big stones uh, when he preaches these words. Here is the sermon. Uh, he preaches it to you. He again uh, says, this is what you should teach your children. And he adds to it that this is what you want to tell the world. Not, this is my personal belief. Uh, you can believe what you believe and I believe in Jesus. No, this is what God has done in space and time. There is evidence. This is what he's done. This is who he is. So this is what you should preach to the peoples of the earth. And it basically comes down to this, uh, that you may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord, your God forever. I guess if we could... Uh, uh, take all of this and summarize its application in, uh, in uh, Joshua's sermon. It is fear the Lord. The hand of the Lord is mighty. He has proven it. Behold, remember, and fear the Lord. Which means, as you know, revere Him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 they had reason to fear uh, in an earthly sense. Moses is dead. They're stepping into a land of conflict. You see the armies crossing the river. Um, but uh, fear of the Lord uh, overwhelms that. Someone writes, a right fear of the Lord is the antidote to every other fear. And commentator John Currid makes this application. He asks first, what do you fear in an earthly sense? What do you fear? Certainly everybody this year has learned to fear greatly getting sick. What do you fear? Um, Courage says Christians are not to fear in that sense the things of this world that may threaten them. They're not to fear those things. Well, where do you flee that you wouldn't fear those things? In times of hostility, he asked, where do you flee? To whom do you go in times of trouble and hardship? He says, it is only the presence of God that can provide true courage and fortitude in the believer. So he says, go to the proof God has given of his presence and power. Go to the proof that he has given and fear the Lord. Worship the Lord, reverence the Lord. He has revealed himself and what he has done. So the key to living in the fear of the Lord, which is the antidote to the fear of this world, the key to living there, taught in our text so powerfully, is remembering, remembering what God has done. And uh, certainly uh, in this next week, you will have the opportunity to do that. I hope you do. May we pray together. Lord, the narrative becomes so weighty and so full that it's really hard to teach it in one session like this. When you wrap it all together, these two chapters and all that is symbolized with the ark and the heaping up of the water and the 12 stones taken from the middle of the dry riverbed and all that it means about you and your uh, keeping of promises, and your power, and your presence. It's 
forever truth for your people, that which we should embrace as we look out at our fears, that which we should teach to our children as they look out at their fears, and that which we can tell the world because it is true. It is reliably, factually true. We pray, O oh God, um, that uh, tonight and in these days and always, God, and in this year, like no other for anyone living on the face of the earth, that we, O oh God, would remember what you have done and adore you. In Jesus' name, amen.